warning others of approaching predators. Yet all of Madagascar's 32 species of lemurs, like the black and white rough lemur here, face an even bigger threat as slash and burn farming wipes out most of their habitat. We're about to show you all of that. The marbles and the madness of Madagascar as we explore this Garden of Eden from one end to the other. Madagascar was once part of Africa. Having sheared off and shifted east in the great continental drift some 165 million years ago. In isolation from the rest of the world, what evolved was a fascinating primate known as the Lima. Other equally as intriguing creatures have evolved here as well. Our quest to find these unique animals will take us from the far north to the far south of this, the world's fourth largest island. On the way, we'll encounter the dancing lemurs. The sun worshippers. A nursery in motion. and the Breakfast Bandits. We'll discover chameleons of all colours and speeds. And we'll meet the Malagasy people. From a rich and friendly culture that, like its wildlife, has developed in a style all of its own. Join us now as we travel with adventure associates to discover the marvels of Madagascar. sailing off the coast of Madagascar, just as the first settlers did here 2,000 years ago. Now, you would have expected they would have come from nearby Africa, but in fact they came from far away Indonesia. And now what's evolved today is the Malagasy language and culture that has its roots in that distant land. One throwback to ancient times is a complicated system of beliefs and superstitions that is still practiced by most Malagasy people today. This system affects the way they think and behave, according to our guide, Donald Retzilla. Donald, you're telling me here that the Malagasy have many taboos, taboos that you call... Fadi. Fadi. Yeah. It's Fadi to work on Tuesday. It's Fadi to feed on pork. It's Fadi to feed on black lemurs. That's reassuring, because it's black lemurs that we'd like to find today, with our first search for them in a reserve known as Lokobi. The rainforests of northern Madagascar are the only place black lemurs can be found. Slowly, slowly, catch the lemur. <laughs> and there, high in the canopy, we spot our first one. Within seconds, the trees are shaking as one after another lemur jumps and scrambles through the canopy. Look at that liquid, so agile. In fact, they've been known to jump as far as 10 metres. Not only are they agile, they're also inquisitive. Young male lemur coming down towards us now. Now, he doesn't seem frightened. We know it's a male because its fur is black. The females we spot soon after, their fur a rich shade of chestnut. 
While these black lemurs come very close, Donald promises even more intimate encounters shortly on a neighbouring island. En route, we meet another inhabitant of the Madagascan forests. Bonjour, bonjour. <laughs> what have we got there? It's a, uh, a little boa constrictor. Not the full three metres. So he's caught this boa constrictor because it's been killing things around the village, eh? They can see the lemurs and chickens in the village. To save the lemurs and chickens, the boa is released well away from the village. On first inspection, the village on the island of Nosikomba looks much the same as any other in Madagascar. The difference, as our self-appointed village guide Eric shows us, are the semi-tame lemurs that descend from the rainforest every morning. Eric shows us just how tame they are, with the help of a pocket full of bananas. What's distinctive about these black lemurs are the flamboyant tufts of white hair on their ears. As we watch, they come even closer to the ground, and us. Well, here's a real opportunity of how to see how tame they are. They're everywhere. Yeah. In the Bougainville, my goodness. And I haven't even, I haven't even encouraged this one, and he's already jumped on my shoulders. It's not only the single lemurs that are proving so playful. Mothers with babies hanging on clamber onto us as well. Only weeks old, their fur is already brown or black, depending on their sex. Even here, they are protected. Wonderful. Well, that's good. That's good for the lemurs. These are our very first lemurs in Madagascar. Oh. Good appetites. Oh, yeah. Very friendly. Sometimes they're too friendly. Take it easy, don't. Gee. They really, they really get quite savage. Whew. They do. Their claws come out. Their teeth go in. You have to be <laughs> very cautious. Very cautious. You can draw blood here. So. Later, the lemurs become even bolder, scampering through and over the thatched huts. While they're endangered elsewhere, the black lemurs of Nosy Comber at least are flourishing, thanks to that Madagascan taboo of Fardy. We're travelling on to hell. Hellville, actually, the local capital named after the former French governor, Admiral de Hell. More like heaven, really, with its delicious fruits and spices, its exotic faces, and its old-fashioned zebu carts. Here, Donald explains that the Malagasy people come from 18 separate tribes. And you speak the Malagasy language? Yes, yes all. All the eight, 18 ethnic groups speak Malagasy. So tell me, how would you say hello in hello, Malagasy? Hello, that is, that depends on the area. Here, no, no western part of the country. Bolatara. Bolatara? Bolatara. Bolatara. Yes, in Tanan River, around Tanan River, the capital. Manahona. Manahona. In western part of the country. Manakori. Manakori, got yeah. that. Manakori. Yeah. One final insight from Donald. He wants to show me why this is called the Il O Parfum, the island of perfume. And here, in a nearby plantation of Nile trees, I began to sniff what he's on about. What's being picked are the flowers of the Ilang Ilang tree. Now this, at last, is the Ilang Ilang plant. Yes. It's ready to pick when it's yellow like that, yes, eh? Yes, the only yellow we have to pick. So let's let's take one of them. Yes. Sir. And of course, from this little plant that we've picked here, we'll be able to produce here up in the factory here the most most yes, delicious of perfumes, yes, eh? Yes, that's very really strong. Oh, smell that! Smell that. Really, <laughs> that's, that's powerful. Yes. That's a powerful perfume, eh? Perfume. The picked flowers are processed in a nearby distillery. Bag after bag of them dumped into a vat, steamed and cured. The oil of the plant is then skimmed off and bottled, selling in the West as exotic perfume. 
after all that picking and all that processing, seven kilograms of the Alang Alang flour has made this the essence of Madagascar. Yes. Ah. Ah, indeed. As I depart the north of Madagascar, I'm intrigued by two other trees. The kapok tree, its seed fibre used to soften pillows the world over. And the baobab tree. We'll find dozens more of these as we explore still further south. Evocative early morning territorial call of the injury. Now that's Madagascar's largest and most elusive lemur. And as we're about to discover, it's one thing to hear them, quite another to see them. Let's try. A good guide, one with sharp eyes and ears and a depth of local knowledge, is what we need to find these elusive injuries. Seraphim Jetatombo is our man. All right, now we can hear the cries. How far away would they be? Yeah, it's about three kilometres away from where we are now. So it's loud. Yeah. But there's still some distance. Yeah, but they've got to be quiet too. Yeah, it's the best time to come out because in the afternoon, forget them. They sleep on the treetops, you know. Closer and closer we stalk until Seraphim makes a sighting. So oh, I see one troop there of Indrina. It's just over there. What have we got? We've got. Three, three, three. I can see four. Yeah, it's one family, you know. Okay, let's see if we can get closer. What we spot is a remarkable primate. A highly mobile black and white ball of fluff that's as big as a small dog. Ah, look at that. We see these two are cuddling each other. Yeah. Now what about that? They're very affectionate, obviously. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. It's a male and a female, you know. So if that's the male and the female, what are the other two? Are they their offspring? Uh, it's their offspring, yeah. Okay, so it's a family? Yeah. Mother and father? Father and the offspring, yeah. Okay, and how long will the youngsters stay with their parents like that? So until uh, they reach the sexual maturity, that means about uh, nine years of age. Yeah. And then what, they'll start their own troop? Yeah, they'll start their own troop, yeah. Here around Andasibi, there are some 60 family groups like this. Now, at this time of the morning, we're seeing them feeding. very active. Yeah, very active. It's feeding time now, yeah. And they're eating, obviously eating leaves, but yeah. you tell me they eat the leaves of some, what, 23 different yeah, species? Yeah, 25, yeah, yeah, different species of leaves a day. Now, why is that? Why do they need so many different types of leaves? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's their diet, uh, sort of vegetarian, you know. That diet of leaves is also their only source of water. Not only don't they drink, they have virtually no tail and instead use their powerful hind legs to leap long distances. They can leap up to 10 metres, you know. <laughs> Quite remarkable. They leap from yeah. one tree to well, another tree to another yeah. tree. They call it uh, braciating, don't they? Mm -hmm. they? Search for leaves, you know. Now we're watching them um, leap away from us. See, we better move on. Come on, let's get let's follow. Okay, they've jumped over here, they're calling. Yes. They're all down forward, right? <laughs> and they don't seem frightened by us at all. Yeah, the calling, you know, it's a communication call. Yeah. So that's the communication call. Then, while we're watching this signal, the injuries launch into a far more dramatic cry. It's, uh, it's an alarm call now. You know. 
They probably see one of the predators as uh, could be hoax or fusa. You know. Now, if that's the alarm call, they're not alarmed by us, are they? No, no. Well, now, this is remarkable. They've given that alarm call, and now they've launched into what appears to be kissing? Yeah, this is a love call, you know. So that's a male and a female. They usually do that if they want to copulate, you know. So they're pursing their lips. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. Just like that. Just like that, yeah. It's been an exhilarating morning, although with only an estimated 280 of these injuries left here at Andesibi, the alarm call could just as well be for the species. They're highly endangered. We don't often see that. Yeah. Today we hear the alarm call, the communication call and the love call. Yeah. Okay. It was really great. Yeah. So we're doing pretty well, eh? Yeah, we did, yeah. The rainforests of Andesibi are rich in other unique creatures as well. Seraphim shows me a breathtaking array of them, most of them endemic to Madagascar. The most famous and fascinating of all are the chameleons. In fact, Madagascar has more than half the chameleon species in the world. From the minute to the largest. Okay, we've got a male of the largest species of chameleon here, eh? That's right. This is uh, Keluma personi, the scientific name. So it's also called uh, person's chameleon. It's the largest chameleon in the world. Now he's got some very, very interesting features. The first of which is he started very, very bright green this morning and we see him changing already. He's starting to go uh, dark. Uh, Yes, you know, uh, it's the surrounding which governs the chameleon's colour. These amazing lizards have adapted to live in trees with feet that grasp like clamps and move ever so stealthily. Like a gladiator, his face has been built for battle. Look at that armoury. Look at the horns, the protective horns at the front there and the, the bright orange eyes that rotate. Those conical eyes swivel independently of one another, one on guard for predators, the other searching for insects. The female of the species? This is the female, person's female, yeah. Much brighter green this one? Yes, that's the difference yes. and the other difference is it has no nasal appendage. Slow to walk, yes but lightning fast with their tongue. Watch this. Okay, it's spotted an insect. That's interesting. Yeah, I see that. So now... I see that. Let's get that. See Look at that. Yeah. Can you believe that? That was a praying man today. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Once it's spotted, it's captured by its tongue. In slow motion, we watch just how fast the tongue extends. Out and back in less than half a second. Fully extended, it exceeds the length of the old body, so it's about 80 centimetres. And what an appetite. Over the next hour, we watch as insect after insect falls victim to these tongues of devastating speed and accuracy. OK, Seraphim, well, that was a very special experience. And now for another one here at Andesibi with these black and white rough lemurs. Black and white rough lemurs. These are stunning lookers, with that collar of fluffed white fur. And agile too, leaping from branch to branch with nonchalant ease. Their most striking pose comes as they sun themselves. An endeavour I'm happy to reward them for. Here he comes. Now what I love is that they love to stand right up in their hind legs. Yes, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. That's it. Ooh, a big bite. Remains up in his hind legs. A big mouthful there. Yeah. No other predators. This lemur feed mainly on fruits and also on nectar and seeds. Our final experience in Andesibi is with a family of common brown lemurs.
first, I meet an adult male. Looking on, his partner and their newborn baby. Very alert too, this little baby. Very alert. Cross you come. Cross you come, Mum. Look at that. Six months of age. Look at Mum. But she'd be very protective now baby's awake, so she'd be very careful not to not to have us harm the baby in any way. Tell us about the brown lemur. So brown lemur is, uh, is very common here in Madagascar. And you say the female brown lemur is more dominant than the male. Yeah. This is uh, uh, like all the lemurs, you know. So the group is always led by the female. Not endangered at all? No, not endangered. It's not like the other species, you know. Not like um, my fingers, which are in great <laughs> danger here at the moment. <laughs> So now he's got a baby you now, so... <laughs> <laughs> Up close. <laughs> Up close and personal. <laughs> it's been a thrilling experience. A taste of even richer lemur encounters ahead. We're heading further south to the capital of Antananarivo. This is a day-long road trip, which in glimpses of the Madagascan way of life. It's wash day, and whole families gather riverside for communal scrubbing. Enterprising teenagers sell honey from discarded whiskey jars. Okay, how much is this? While these women sell loquats they've just picked. Try one of those. Like a little pear. The Madagascan countryside exudes a tropical lushness, although regrettably large parts of it have been scarred by overzealous farmers and loggers. Well, this is so typical of what's happening here in Madagascar. Eighty percent of this countryside has been cleared either by loggers like this or slash and burn farmers. In fact, every year one third of this country is burned by farmers. Such ruthless clearing of land is having an impact on the very creatures that makes Madagascar so special. In the old days, there were 50, uh, 50 species of lemurs in Madagascar, now only about 32 left. So this is just one example to show you how how bad this deforestation is in Madagascar. Sadly, the people's need for firewood leaves most of Madagascar's unique species of wildlife endangered, with authorities battling to change public attitudes. Centuries ago, Madagascar had a royal family, with their palace at Ambo Humunga still guarded by a gigantic stone. Forty slaves once rolled this across an entrance to keep out intruders. The palace walls were constructed using egg whites as cement. And various queens used this building as their retreat, while the king slept in a simple timber shed known as the Bavato. It's become a place of pilgrimage, although we found the crowds preferred the nearby markets. On sale here, a collection of dried plants the Malagasy use to cure a range of ailments. Every Saturday morning is showtime. It's a forum for groups of Malagasy musicians and dancers. This group is known as Orivazi. Their music a combination of drums, piano accordion and a tin shaker. The Karadetska. And the dancers, they're singing about the history of love.
The vast waters of the Indian Ocean surrounding Madagascar are one of the most fertile fishing grounds in the world. Every morning, dozens of dhows head out off the west coast to spend the day fishing. Within hours, they've caught good-sized tuna, which the fishermen's wives balance on their heads as they trek to market. It's here that I meet my new guide, Francois Bahako. Bienvenue à Murundava. Welcome to Murundava. Great. Bienvenue. If it's foot power the locals use, then so should we, Francois insists. And so off we head inland, surrounded by all the sights and sounds of a bustling Madagascan thoroughfare. Just like the giant tuna, they balance all manner of goods on their heads. While zebus are transport for the slightly more affluent. Hitchhikers are always welcome. Then there's the human-powered school bus, 15 children taking the ride today. Just off the road, rice is harvested in much the same fashion as it has been for hundreds of years. While other children sort lima beans for sale at the local market. Painted faces are common too. And what a fascinating scene unfolding in front of us here. This lady's preparing some sweet potato. Yes. And she's made up with this very heavy decoration on her face. This would be from the roots of the... Masudwani plant. Masudwani plant. Yeah. What we're seeing this lady behind doing is rubbing the root of this plant onto a rock, mixing it with water, and then we're watching her starting to uh, daub that on her face. She's daubing that all over for a beauty treatment yeah, and for sun protection. For sun protection. And quite common amongst the ladies here in Madagascar. As for their dead, the Malagasy erect huge tombs, just as the royal families here once did decorating them with paintings and sacrificing as many zebus as they can afford. Now we're seeing here a lot of zebu horns yeah. and what the zebu horns represent is the fact that this person has been reasonably wealthy. We see at least six horns, sets of horns here, so that represents his wealth. All of this travelling has been leading us to a large collection of one of the symbols of Madagascar, the baobab tree. Now legend has it that the devil plucked the huge trunk of the baobab, thrust its branches into the earth and left its roots in the air. Well, one of the remarkable things about these baobab trees is that some of them are up to a thousand years old and the reason they've survived that long is that because they're so thick farmers simply haven't been able to cut through them. That's how they've survived. So big is the trunk, older trees store thousands of litres of water. Now if a tree does go over, you would do what? You'd use the bark to make bark. houses? Ro rope. Rope? It's a small string for mandolin. Oh, a small string for mandolin, okay. Yes. Together, they make an impressive display. No more so than this line of trees, the Avenue of Baobabs. This is one of the most photographed sites in Madagascar, a place to visit at the right time of day. Well, we're in for something very, very special here, Francois, because it's sunset and the avenue of baobabs and we look like being in for a sensational sunset tonight, eh? Something very special. Yeah, something special is that. <laughs> and what a photo opportunity it is. The towering baobabs, a flurry of activity as the sun slips below the horizon for yet another day. We 
We're heading for the southern tip of Madagascar, a journey best conquered by air because of the sheer size of this island. Even on the ground, there are still long distances and moving obstacles to contend with as we head for a legendary reserve, one where we hope to see several fascinating new species of lemurs. How far the spiny forest? Theo Zafferson will guide us to them, but first he wants to show us some most unusual vegetation. These are the spiny forests, a tall, spindly variety of cactus that are sought by both humans and lemurs. Fascinating plants are the Dederassi plant. Yes, this is one of the most important tree in the dry spiny forest of Madagascar because look how people use it for making houses. And the lemurs uh, that we're about to see like eating these as well. Yes. The Malagasy people we pass are indeed a hardy lot. Walking long distances with food and supplies they've bought at market. The homes they've built from the cactus plant, though, show just how poor they are. They're more like children's cubby houses, with entire families squeezing inside. So, Thea, these places here would house, what, six to eight people? Each yeah, little six dwarfs. people living inside, and they cook inside, they sleep inside, they do everything inside. Surrounded by such friendly and objectly poor people, you're compelled to give something, anything to help, even the humble contents of our medical kit. Give them everything I've got. First aid, a first aid friend. Bye. Bye. Onwards we press. Heavy rain reminding us that the wet season is fast approaching and the time for good encounters with lemurs is running short. The reserve we travel so far to explore is Berenti, where the lemurs are said to be prolific. Certainly the welcoming party is a positive sign. Well, we've arrived at a very, very special time here in Berenti. Every September, several species of lemurs here give birth, and now, one month later, it's like a nursery in motion. Everywhere you look, there's youngsters clinging to their mothers. The most active mothers and babies here in Berenti are the ringtail lemurs. From birth, they're flashing that distinctive striped tail. They're coming out in families, is that right? They work in the Family same troop. Group. There is about 28 groups of uh, ringtail lemur in 250 hectares here in Berente. Where lemur numbers are dwindling elsewhere, here they're actually increasing. The population of the lemurs, like here in Berente, is increased because the female can get the baby once a year, sometimes twins. Head of the family amongst the ringtails is this female. So even though she's a mother carrying her baby, she's still the leader of this family. Yes, the leader is, yeah. If the female lady has a baby, she always leads the other group because she knows the territory and she's very sensitive in case of predators. So she should find it first before the group and she used the alarm call and all of the group go under the nest of the trees. Now she's giving the communication call, calling in the family. Yes, so if she's giving like that, all of the group coming and to ask her what's the happening here. So she wants to know if all of the group here or not. That's why they use the communication call. We spend the remainder of the day observing the ringtails watching just how affectionate and caring they are with one another. By night, they sleep high on the branches, 
well away from predators. But come the first rays of a new day, they strike up a very welcoming pose. Now this early morning ritual, stretching of the arms, obviously taking in the sun, eh? Yes. Getting some vitamin D, D from the sun. And they'll do this just after sunrise. Sometimes we'll see the whole road here covered with them for a few minutes. Mothers with babies clinging on their backs. Fathers alongside. The whole family stretched out like this. As we watch this relaxed ritual, another less friendly encounter takes place right in front of us. That's the stink fight, you can see. There's some gland that comes out from the wrist, through the gland, which is very stinky, because he's unhappy to see this one. That's why you see that rubbing the tail like this, and through the gland to the others, and that smells very strong, which is very stinky. And if this one can f smell that, move away. I'm not happy to see you. See? Ah, I see. That's right. After that sunbacon feud, what better reward than a feast? And over here we're seeing some cactus and a lemur tucking into this cactus. Yes, because you know, if the lemur get hot, sometimes they don't find the water in the forest. They eat the cactus leaves, because you know the cactus are very succulent, they can find some liquid from that leaves. Now for an even more fascinating lemur here in Barenti. It's the Baro Safaka, the dancing lemur. It's quite a spectacle. These safakas are the only lemurs to move along the ground on their hind legs like this. Not only upright, but sideways, because if they hop straight ahead, they would overbalance and fall. When they jump like this, after three meters, they get tired, and it turns to ah, like this. Okay, okay. So it's, like, it's almost like a dance. Three yeah. steps this way, yes, and then and three turn steps and three first, steps yeah. this way. <laughs> what a dance! We're compelled to follow suit. The Safaka three-step shuffle, and off she goes. One, two, three. One. Two, three. It's a very neat dance that she does, isn't it? One, two, three. <laughs> One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> just like the ringtail lemurs, these safakas have just given birth, with babies clinging on tight for the bouncy ride. And once they've settled above the ground, the babies develop quickly. This youngster is learning to be independent, making forays further and further away from mother. His biggest challenge is learning to leap. Three months of this practice and he'll be off mother's back altogether. Another characteristic of safakas is that they don't need to drink water. So they don't drink, they get their water by eating leaves and yes, cactus they, plants? Yes, they eat the fresh leaves and the fresh, le uh, fresh fruit for getting water. And to reach those leaves, well it's never too hard. Now they are agile, look at this one coming down, hanging right upside down and feeding upside down like that. Yes, they do like that, but not so long time, because if there's a fruit which they, they like, so they hang upside down and eating that fruit. But the baby's not afraid to drop down on that. The safakas and ringtail lemurs are not the only stars of Barenti, as we'll discover tonight.
Exploring the spiny forest of Berenti at night reveals a host of creatures, an assortment of colourful frogs. And chameleons, these are some of the world's smallest. And of course, still more lemurs. This is the white-footed sportive lemurs. This is one of the night species of uh, lemurs here in Berente. Well, tonight we're seeing him active. We're seeing him eating, eating what uh, looks eating like... Eating the leaves of the didioracid trees. That is the one of his favourite meal here. High above us, a family of safakas. And below them? Okay, now this would be another mouse lemur, would it not? Yes, this is the grey mouse lemur, one of the smallest uh, primates in the world. So he lives solitary life also, and he eats the insects. It looks very much like a mouse or a rat. Yes, but there is a difference. So the grey mouse lemur has the eyes which is very big and in front of the forehead. Come the new day, we're rewarded with one final lemur encounter. Well, one has to take an enormous amount of care over breakfast. Guard your food carefully because these guys are bandits. <laughs> one family in particular is very bold. Dad is first in. His baby is surprisingly frisky, scampering in with mum for a bite, before the whole family raids together. This is my cue to move on. Ahead, the climax of our Madagascan experience. The legacy of the fierce storms that sweep in across the Indian Ocean are evident right along the southern coastline of Madagascar. Thankfully the weather is much kinder today as we set off on our own boating exploits. What a final adventure here in Madagascar. A trip down a coastal lagoon to the fishing village of Lukuru. Even before we get there, we meet some of its residents scouring these shallow waters. <laughs> In Lakuru itself, there's an even warmer welcome. We're escorted by what seems like all of the village's children. At first glance, life here seems peaceful enough. But far rowdier scenes await us. This is the start of a seasonal event known as Ringa. Residents of a nearby village have travelled here to challenge the locals. A circle is formed and the performance begins. The air fills with teenage voices. Backed by a three-string Madagascan guitar and a shaker known as a kashak. Then the combatants emerge, parading around and around with their ceremonial spears. It's all meant as a celebration, staged at the end of the harvest. The contest proper begins with the two adversaries grappling one another. Like sumo wrestlers, the object here is to throw your opponent onto the ground.
And the highlight for the entertainers comes at the end of the wrestling when they parade inside the circle. It's an exhilarating contest, a fitting climax to an adventure that has taken us from one end of Madagascar to the other. Today's sail east of Madagascar brings us to another paradise deep in the Indian Ocean, the island of Mauritius. Scenically, Mauritius is alluring. Mark Twain's verdict was that Mauritius was made first, then heaven. On shore, there are volcanic spires, hills of multicoloured sands, and botanical gardens filled with giant water lilies and huge seed pods. Just over a million people inhabit Mauritius, descendants of the French and English who've colonised this island. The Dutch left here in disgrace after killing and eating the last dodo bird. Our guide here is Damesh Sihari. He tells me just how multicultural this small island is. You have to learn to speak English, of course, as we're speaking, French yeah. and Creole. Creole is like a mother tongue. As, let's say it's just like a French people. They don't have to learn French at school. For English people, it's just Creole. It's a normal language for us. But at the age of four and a half, primary school education, we start learning both French and English language here. There's religious diversity here as well. Hindu temples catering for one-third of the population. Sugar plays an important role in the economy. Vast fields of sugar cane covering the island. And they even use a zebu to pulp the cane in the time-honoured fashion. If it's wildlife that interests you, they're a giant tortoise to feed. While the fishing is very good, giant dorado, very prolific. And to round off our stay, a sunset performance of the dance of Mauritius, the Sega. Thank you. 